welcome back to Inside the Black Box. And today's Black Box is a particularly cryptic and mysterious one. It is the Nintendo Zapper Gun. Uh, this is something that people probably have lying around the house. But the mystery, of course, is why doesn't this thing work with my $5,000 75-inch LCD curved plasma TV? Uh, and so that is actually a very good question because the Nintendo machine itself works with your modern TV. Why not the gun? And it turns out that the reason the gun doesn't work is because it takes advantage of how an old CRT TV worked. But before we get into how all that happens, uh, let's have a look at the gun itself. Um, this is not, of course, the first uh, gun type game which uh, Nintendo produced long before Nintendo got into electronic gaming. Uh, Gunpei Yokoi, who was the uh, inventor behind the NES and lots of other Nintendo toys, had developed a uh, series of shooting games where it was all kind of, you know, pre-computer chips, digital electronics. It was all analog, uh, but essentially it was a, uh, a series of guns. It were gun uh, handguns, pistols, rifles, and so on. Uh, and they came with little targets that you could shoot. Some of them looked like beer bottles. Some of them looked like regular bullseye targets. And the cool thing about them was that they were all kind of uh, mechanically animated. So you would point the gun at the beer bottle, pull the trigger, and if you were pointing at it correctly, then the beer bottle would kind of split apart. It had a little magnet and a, a thing which kind of caused it to fly apart, right? So pretty cool. And what's interesting is the reason Nintendo got into building gun games, um, and this would have been like literally 1959 or 1960, uh, the reason they got into that is because Sharp Electronics, which is of course another massive Japanese uh, electronics manufacturer, had just gotten into developing light sensor parts uh, and they were kind of looking for applications and places where they could essentially sell this. So they gave a couple of sample chips to uh, Gunpei Yokoi and said, hey, let's see, you know, can you do anything with these things? Can we strike up a relationship? And so Yokoi developed this light gun game, uh, which turned out to be a very good deal for Sharp because they supplied the parts. And then later, uh, when they built the NES, um, of course, having guns with your gaming consoles in the early 80s was extremely common, right? Um, there were a lot of standalone kind of gun games in the pre-console world, uh, sorry, pre-cartridge world. Uh, and so it was fairly natural for Nintendo to say, yeah, let's put a gun onto our NES. Uh, so the NES Zapper is actually available not just for the American version of the console, uh, but also for the Japanese version. So. Uh, this particular one uh, says Nintendo Zapper, it says 1985 over here. That's not, again, it's not necessarily the year this particular gun was made, right? That's just the uh, the year that the model would have been done. Uh, engraved here it says model number NES 00, 005. Uh, so the fact that it says NES means that this is an American model. Uh, made in Japan, patent pending. Um, and it's got a really nice kind of science fiction, you know, laser gun look to it. Um, some manufacturers decided to go down the route of making their guns look like realistic guns, typically kind of cowboy six shooter type of gun. Uh, Nintendo, of course, was very shrewd. They didn't want to have any issues with, um, you know, controversial subjects, violence, etc. So you make it look like a science fiction gun and you kind of solve that problem, right? Uh, very clever. There's some very nice things about this gun on the outside. Again, you know, Nintendo is very smart when it came to physical design. It's got a really nice heft to it. It feels pretty heavy uh, and it's also quite balanced. Like I can hold this on one finger uh, and the gun remains balanced, uh, which is important because it's got this extremely long cable at the back. And this cable actually is 10 feet long. Uh, again, you know, Nintendo really understood how these products of theirs were used. You have to sit on the couch some distance from the TV in order to use it. You can't sit as close as you're sitting while you're playing, uh, you know, Mario, for example. You want to be sitting really far back to make it look like, make it feel like you're in a shooting gallery, right? So extra long cable, uh, it uses the exact same plug uh, that the NES controller uses, which is really nice because people just, you know, you don't have to have the cost of additional uh, uh, plugs, etc. in your machine, you can use the same thing. And it becomes very simple for people to use. They just buy it, they look at it and they say, oh yeah, I know where this goes immediately without having to have instructions or anything else. And of course, it's got the trigger, which is, just makes a really nice noise. And if you grew up uh, playing with toy guns in the 80s, that is a very familiar noise. Um, the other nice thing about this, which people don't often notice, is that it is absolutely ambidextrous. I can hold it with my left hand or my right hand, and it's still equally comfortable uh, because there are no extrusions on the handle, which kind of poke on either side. So it's very nice. Nintendo doesn't have to worry about left-handed kids. Uh, they've got you covered, right? So uh, let's start taking this thing apart and see what we have inside. So again, in the early Nintendo days, these things were held together with real screws. Um, there is actually a lot of screws on this one. 
Um, this is before they switched to their ridiculous security screws. Uh, and what's nice about this one is that they don't have any of those mechanical plastic latches either, so it makes it very clean to take apart. Uh, so we remove that face plate. And actually this gray part is just kind of like a jacket. Uh, and the gun itself sits like, you know, with no pants on and works just fine. Uh, I guess that part is just to make it look cool. All right, let's keep going. Uh, and it's got two smaller screws at the front. Uh, just take those off. The whole thing is done with two size screws. So the kind of larger ones uh, like these and then these very small ones. Uh, and again, that's something that shows very clever understanding of your supply chain. Um, you don't want to have a device which has many, many different kinds of parts because you don't want to be in a situation in your factory where you're trying to put together NES Zapper guns and suddenly you realize, oh man, we can't build anymore because we've run out of the fourth kind of screw. By limiting the number of different parts in your device, you make it easier to track inventory and know that you're gonna be able to uh, fulfill your orders. Okay, so the whole top part comes off like this, and there we go. That's fallen out, let me put that back over there. So this is kind of the innards of the Zapper gun. At the front, we have a little plastic lens, <clears throat> and this is very important because what this does is it essentially focuses the light sensor inside the gun so that uh, from the point of view of the gun, the light doesn't spread as much. So it's less of a kind of shotgun effect and more of a kind of focused beam. Because ideally, what you want to recreate the experience of you know shooting a gun, which has a very concentrated, focused area of effect, is you want to have your light sensing be like as narrow as possible. <clears throat> now, if they were using a laser beam, firing an actual laser beam off here, that problem would be solved because laser beams have got what's called um, collimated light, which means the light doesn't spread. But with regular light, you can't do that. But you can correct for it using a lens like this one. Um, and actually, if you have a zapper gun which is not working very well, a good fix is to kind of open it apart and look to see if the lens is cloudy or clean or what. Uh, because, of course, if it was sitting right at the front of the barrel, um, if you had smoke or dirt or whatever, and, uh, it was very common for it to mess up the lens, right? So have a look at that one. And now inside what we have is very few parts, right? Again, very nice, clever design. Very simple. You've got this thing at the back, this kind of big golden thing. Um, now, what is that thing? Well, that's actually very, very simple. That's just a counterweight. It's just kind of sitting in there. It's just a big blob of metal. And the point of that is to give you that nice balance. If it doesn't have that in place, the gun is kind of unwieldy. So that just gives it the nice heft uh, and the feeling of balance. So that's pretty cute. This is a company that understands toys, right? It really is. Uh, then other than that, what we have is the cable kind of snaking off the bottom. And then we have this, which is the kind of interesting magical bit, and then the trigger assembly inside this uh, gray piece. So let me just free this up <clears throat> so that we can put the orange parts aside. There we go, just three screws holding it together. And then we'll be able to kind of separate this out. Oh, and the shielding for this is already falling off. Let's put that back in for now. Okay, there we go. So it's got a single kind of disconnect here, which is for the, oh, which actually connects the electronics, which is this little board here, back to the actual plug, right? So at this point, we're free. <clears throat> and so this is actually all the, uh, all the important pieces of the gun. Well, I guess you could argue the lens is actually also quite important. Uh, but this is all the kind of uh, functioning pieces. So you've got the trigger piece, um, which really, as we'll see, is just this micro switch up here, which feeds back into this piece. So let's take the shield off. Uh, the shield, as you'll recall, when we were talking about the uh, uh, early 8-bit cartridges, part of that is because it sits on top of uh, a chip here and you want to control for radiation but also it kind of forms a convenient hood so that your light sensor doesn't get um, interference from other parts right so this is the actual electronic bits you can see it is very very simple it's just got a very small number of parts uh, for doing all the work that's required actually as we'll see pretty much all the work of running one of these shooting games was done by the NES machine itself and not by the zapper. So what we have here is a bunch of capacitors here, these little green parts. Um, 
and these really act as filters to prevent kind of spikes of electricity from interfering with uh, the operation of the machine and that's important because this little part at the front here um, this kind of little blobby transparent piece that is actually the light sensor um, and that light sensor actually is sensing infrared light which is quite interesting um, in order to prevent you know other outside light sources like you know reflection on your TV or the Sun or whatever it is from interfering too much with this um, you had some of these filters in place to kind of help with that the interesting part here is done by this chip right here um, which is actually a it's labeled uh, IR 3 t 7 a Japan and it's from Sharp Electronics so Sharp is still at this point in time even from 1960 up to 1985 providing the electronics required to make the Nintendo light games work which is quite cool <clears throat> so this particular chip what it does is it demodulates the input that's coming in from the light sensor here and it converts it into a simple electrical signal uh, which will then go out through the cable because really what the NES is going to do is at some point when it's running the game it's going to query the gun and say hey are you seeing black or white right now right um, because as you recall when you play one of these uh, shooting games like Duck Hunt right which is the kind of uh, uh, the famous gun game because it is the one that shipped with the gun itself um, when you pull the trigger in Duck Hunt what happens is the entire screen goes black and the place where the ducks are are drawn as white rectangles and it is in sensing those rectangles where they are on the screen that the magic of the NES guns uh, games happen right and so this module is what's going to convert the light that's coming in here into a simple uh, one or zero right? either I'm seeing white it's a one or I'm seeing black it's a zero so that the NES can actually uh, use that information to tell if you're pointing at the duck or not okay so then what about this trigger assembly here this is the part that makes the nice noise uh, let's pop this open and see what it does what I find interesting is even though this makes that nice clicky noise um, Nintendo must have known that people who wrote gun games were going to put sound effects for the gun anyway so that's kind of interesting that they put this uh, kind of mechanical noise maker in here even though they had a machine that could actually produce pretty nice sound effects all right so it's got three of these small screws the same kind of screws that we had on the outside <coughs> And I need to be careful here because there are springs inside this and I don't want them all to just fly out. Okay, there we go. So this is what the inside of the trigger assembly looks like. Uh, it's pretty simple. What you have is up here you have a micro switch um, which is uh, labeled uh, Matsushita which is actually a pretty famous company when it, in terms of making switches. They used to make switches for uh, arcade games etc. So if you pull this you can actually... Oh, it's not attached. So that is the micro switch. Uh, it's the same kind of micro switch you would find inside, say, a Street Fighter 2 machine uh, button, right? And it's uh, very clicky. It's ridiculously overpowered for this application. These switches are rated to hundreds of thousands of cycles, and they can take a huge amount of pressure, right? Uh, so that's pretty nice. Um, and it's a standard part. Nintendo didn't have to develop anything funny. And then what we have is when you pull the trigger, oops, there goes a the spring. Let's try and hold that in place. When you pull the trigger, there's a little part up here that catches against this. And when that returns to the front, see if we can see that better, then it makes the clicking sound. And this white part is connected to the uh, arm of the switch. So as you pull it back, just hold that up so you can see it more clearly, then it presses the switch. And that's how that works. Okay. So then, how do you use all this stuff, the little light sensor at the front, uh, the IR demodulator, the switch, how does all that come together to actually detect whether you have hit the damn duck on the screen or not? So let's go to the whiteboard and explain both how a CRT TV puts its picture together and then how the NES games uses the zapper gun to tell whether you've hit the duck. Okay, so before we start talking about how the zapper uh, is able to detect whether you were pointing at the duck or not, we need to understand how a regular old CRT TV, which remember in the days of the NES was the only kind of TV you got, uh, how that actually draws a picture, because it turns out to be crucial to the story. So 
uh, let's take the case of a, uh, a North American console, right? North American uh, NES has used a television system called NTSC, which stands for the National Television Standards Committee, I think. Uh, and they were a body that set the standard for how television pictures should be uh, drawn. Well, in fact, they were one of the bodies that did that, right? Because in the most of the Americas, excluding Brazil and a couple of places, uh, and a lot of Asia, places like Japan, Burma, uh, South Korea, they use this television system. In Europe, of course, there was a different body called PAL, uh, which set a standard, uh, and that and PAL was used in uh, pretty much all of Europe and then other places like South Africa. Uh, and then there was a system which was used just by the French called CCAM. Uh, but in the American and Japanese consoles, it's NTSC. Uh, and the way an NTSC picture is put together is like this. So imagine this is our uh, television picture that we need to draw, right? So we need to draw our trees here, and we need to draw the duck flying off, etc. right? So how is this picture actually drawn uh, by a television? So as you probably know, uh, televisions use a system called raster drawing, which means that they are drawn in lines, right? And the way NTNC works is it starts at the top left of the picture here, and it starts to draw the picture one line at a time until it's gotten all the way to the bottom. And actually the way it draws is in a kind of Z chip. It draws like this, then it comes back, then it draws, then it comes back, then it draws. And the reason that it has that zigzag pattern is inside a TV, uh, those giant vacuum tubes which made up the screen, uh, the way those vacuum tubes work is you essentially have so imagine we have the vacuum tube drawn from the side now. They kind of had a curved screen, right? And they had a shape that looked like this. What you have is at the front, this is the screen surface. You have a special chemical coating on the inside of the screen, which is called the phosphor, right? And then at the back here, you've got essentially an electron gun. And it sounds as dangerous as that implies, right? It will essentially fire a stream of electrons at the screen to kind of activate the phosphor and it'll leave a kind of bright spark and of course it does this so very fast that it looks like a complete picture to you but it's in fact it's like when you turn a light bulb on and then turn it off and the, pic and the light bulb kind of stays there for a minute and then fades up it's essentially doing that across the entire screen and actually what's interesting about this uh, electron beam is that in order for it to form this electron cannon first of all the inside of a vacuum tube is a vacuum that's why it's called uh, that which means that of course televisions are quite fragile if you broke or if you cracked the screen, it could lead to the entire thing kind of imploding in on itself and uh, uh, that's it, right? You've lost the most expensive part of your TV. Uh, the reason it has to be a vacuum is because when you fire your electron beam across, you don't want the electrons bumping into air molecules because if they did that, then the picture would be distorted. So, you know, it's super complicated from that point of view. And then in order to generate that electron beam, you need hundreds of volts. The insides of these tubes are fantastically dangerous. So you should never ever, when you find an old CRT TV, Goodwill or whatever, just take it home, open it up to see how it works, right? Before you do that, you should leave it disconnected, unplugged completely for a few days to allow whatever residual electric charges inside this thing to kind of uh, fade out because working with these devices is just ridiculously dangerous. It's one of the reasons that it's really nice to work with modern plasma and LCD TVs because you just don't risk your life and limb uh, anymore, right? Okay, so let's go back to how the picture is drawn. Okay, so as we said, the picture is drawn a kind of zigzag pattern, right? The electron beam starts up here, it gets dragged off to one side, then it gets moved down and dragged to the next line and so on, and you have your raster pattern coming down. Now the thing about these tubes is, regardless of how big your TV was, whether it was a 9-inch TV or a 27-inch TV, it takes the same amount of time for the picture to be drawn. And in NTSC, that, the amount of time it takes is expressed as the refresh rate, which you've probably heard somewhere is 60 hertz. And what that means is that it takes 1 60th of a second to draw the entire picture, right? which is about 16 milliseconds doesn't matter how big your TV is, right? Which means if you're playing it on a tiny portable TV or on your giant living room TV, after about eight milliseconds, you will be done drawing half of the picture. And so that, the fact that you can always tell by counting time how far down the picture you're going to be turns out to be very important for the zapper. Uh, because the zapper actually has to solve two problems in determining whether you've hit the duck, right? First of all, 
uh, as we said, when you pull the trigger, right, the screen goes dark and we get uh, a white block drawn in the space where the duck is. We'll draw it in red, but it's white, right? Um, what the zapper has to do is it, it has to tell, is my X axis pointing at the duck? In other words, left to right, am I pointing at the duck? And then up and down, am I pointing at the duck? And the way it does that is the left to right is handled by simply looking at the color uh, that the, uh, the uh, optic sensor on the gun is receiving. Is it receiving white or is it receiving black? But the up and down, we need to do some other way. You can't just say, am I seeing white or not? Because if you have two ducks, right, like you have in the later levels, and I'm seeing white from the gun, which duck did I hit? You can't tell that, right? Because it's like, well, if I see a, a, a blob of white on my gun, it could have been this one or it could have been that one. How do you tell them apart? So the way you do that is like this. The NES knows the positions of the two ducks when you pull the trigger, right? So you pull the trigger and at that moment the NES says, okay, I know where my ducks are, so I'm going to draw them on the screen in white and I'm going to black out the rest of the screen. And it knows that this top duck is down a certain percentage of the screen. Let's say this is 10% down. And this one is, say, you know, 25% down. Actually, it looks more like 50% down. So it knows that because, of course, it's keeping track of the positions of the ducks, right? So now what it does is it blanks out the screen and it waits for a new frame to get drawn. And so when the new frame is about to get drawn, it knows, okay, the electron beam is at the top. So now I'm going to wait until 10% of a frame refresh has gone down. So in other words, I'm going to wait for about 1.6 milliseconds here. And then it asks the question of the gun, okay, are you seeing white or not? Right? Because if from this point on the gun rest says, yes, I'm seeing white, then you must be inside of this rectangle, right? Because the gun to the left and right is either picking up white or not. And the fact that you are 10% of the screen down means you must be looking at this duck and not that one, because we haven't drawn that one yet, right? So you can't be possibly seeing that one. Then if, of course, it doesn't see anything, if the gun says, hey, I'm not seeing anything, then it says, okay, that's cool. I'm gonna keep waiting for me to get to the top of the next duck. And now I'm gonna ask the gun again, hey, are you seeing anything now? And if at this point the gun says, yeah, I'm seeing white, then it's like, okay, you must have hit the bottom duck, right? But if the gun says, no, I'm not seeing anything, we wait until you get to the bottom here. And if at this point the gun hasn't seen any white, then you know it can't have been pointing inside this block because we tested that earlier in the frame. And it can't have been inside this block because we tested that just now. And therefore, you miss, right? So that's how you're able to have two ducks simultaneously on the screen. And you'll notice if you pay careful attention uh, to the duck hunt game, the two ducks never overlap each other vertically. There's never a point at which you have this. Right? Notice that they're overlapping each other here for this amount of time. And the reason we can't have that is when you start drawing and you say, okay, tell me when you get to this point. Now, are you seeing any white? And the gun says no. When you get here where the overlap begins, if the gun says, yes, I'm seeing white, now you can't tell whether it's this duck or that one right? Because they both occupy the same space. So the game solves that problem by ensuring that the two ducks never overlap vertically, right? They always kind of fly apart by leaving a gap between themselves, right? So that's how the NES zapper is able to tell. Well, it's actually the NES that's doing all the work. The zapper is just doing something very dumb. It's just saying, I can see white, I can see white, I can see black, I can see black, that's it, right? But the NES is able to kind of distinguish between what is actually the top duck or the bottom duck. Okay, so that is how the, essentially the game logic behind detecting whether you've hit the duck works or not. And it's not just duck hunt, right? Like every other game, like Wild Guns, etc., cetera, use the uh, zapper gun, use the same idea. Uh, the, the idea behind drawing, you know, the kind of white block where the target is, is something that was eventually uh, kind of dropped in favor of more accurate technology, which was used on things like, uh, you know, the Dreamcast and the original Xbox. Uh, because, of course, they had light gun games too. <clears throat> what they did instead was redraw the entire screen white and then track, while the screen was being drawn white, track the actual point at which the electron beam was hitting the phosphorus. And the reason you could do that was because the you know game, uh, machines like the Dreamcast and the Xbox were much, much more powerful and faster than the NES. So you could track with that much more speed, right? You, you had... 
even though the amount of time you have to track the entire screen is 60 milliseconds and the NES might only have been able to keep track of one line at a time, uh, things like the Xbox uh, and the Dreamcast would have been able to follow the beam because they were the processors were powerful enough to do that. Um, so now let's answer the damn question. Why does my brand new super fancy LG curved screen TV not support my NES Zapper? And the answer is very simple. The whole mechanism here relies on the idea that the screen is going to get drawn in a particular way and a single frame is always going to take 16 milliseconds to redraw, right? That is the whole premise, the assumption that the NES is making when it does the sensing of light using the infrared sensor. Um, LCD TVs, plasma TVs, basically everything out beyond CRTs or more modern than a CRT don't have a common way of drawing the screen anymore, right? And also the refresh rate doesn't take 16 milliseconds anymore. They're all over the place. You can buy a TV that's got a 200 hertz refresh rate now. 200 hertz would be five milliseconds to redraw the entire screen instead of 16. Uh, some modern TVs, instead of drawing the screen kind of top to bottom in a raster pattern, blast the entire picture simultaneously on because they have got memory internally that where they build the picture in and then put it on, just like a computer monitor does, right? So the basic assumption that the NES is making about how the screen is gonna get drawn, raster wise, right? Top, top left, down to bottom right. And the fact that it's gonna take 16 milliseconds to get redrawn just doesn't exist. So what happens is you're running your, your, you plug your NES into your fancy TV, it works fine. You pull the trigger, the screen goes black with the white blocks, just like you'd expect. But of course, the NES is expecting, okay, after so many milliseconds, I should be seeing white. Am I seeing white? No. Okay, that means I haven't seen the duck. So now I'm gonna wait some more and so on. While it's doing all that, the picture has been drawn in a completely different way. And so all the assumptions that the NES is doing are kind of gone. It's kind of like this. The way the NES was drawing was, imagine you, turn, you go to a very familiar place, like your bedroom, right? And you turn off all the lights. Now, you don't have a way to directly see where you're going inside your bedroom, but you know the layout of your bedroom. And using that knowledge, you can kind of navigate your way around and get into bed, right? Now imagine, uh, that's the old CRT world. In the LCD world, imagine now that I have rearranged all your furniture, turn the light off and then say, okay, go to bed, what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna start bumping into stuff because all your assumptions about the way your bedroom is laid out are no longer valid. And that's what's happening with these NES games, right? So it is unfortunate, but that's, that's just what happens. In the old days, there was just one technology for doing TVs. The uh, NES machine took advantage of that, right? They took sh the shortcut uh, they optimize the code to work specifically with the way TVs worked, and then that's it. Why can't they support modern TVs? Well, like we said in the previous episode when we looked at the cartridges, when you're engineering one of these systems, you have to make um, your common scenario be the one that works, right? Maybe some of the engineers at Nintendo thought, yeah, we're gonna live in one day, you know, 20 years from now, they're gonna be TVs that run at 200 hertz. Maybe they thought that, I don't know, probably not, right? I mean, who wants a 200 hertz TV? Um, but the truth is they could only support the common scenario, which is the regular old NTSC TV, right? Um, and so that's it. So what does that mean you can never play Duck Hunt on your big TV again? Well, not on a regular NES machine, but there is a way to play Duck Hunt on your old TV with a gun, if you really want. Um, there are emulators which you can download, which allow you to uh, play Zapper games using a, a mouse, right? So if you get a PC emulator, play it on your big screen TV, you can use the mouse to control the crosshairs of where the shooting is gonna happen. And then there are places such as Ultimark, uh, I'll put the link down in the video description, that sell a gun, uh, which instead of using the kind of weight for raster, actually simulates a mouse, right? So the gun will actually, as you move, point the gun at your TV, your mouse pointer will move with it. And then of course, using that mouse method, you can play Duck Hunt on your regular TV. Uh, now, unfortunately, those guns aren't, aren't exactly cheap because, of course, the technology that they're using is very advanced. Uh, they're actually using LED track. You put an LED strip bar above your TV and it tracks that to figure out the orientation of the gun. So it's fairly advanced stuff. Uh, but if you really want to play your old shooting games on your giant fancy TV, uh, then that's what you got to do. And let's face it, if you can afford a 90-inch curved screen Samsung TV, then you can probably afford, you know, the gun. So that's it. Uh, that was how the zapper works and why it doesn't work on your modern TV. Uh, hope you enjoyed that. Keep well, see you for the next one.